120 years after Wyatt Earp opened a gambling house in Pioneer Square, the Wild West returns to Washington State. He put the gun on my face and said, give me the money. As cash-heavy pot shops turn into the OK Corral. <laughs> These modern-day desperados, armed with handguns and assault rifles. One guy took our shift lead and told him that he had 10 seconds to open the safe or he was going to kill him. And they're not afraid to use them. I got shot in the leg. I got shot through and through in the arm. I got shot through the abdomen. Now, cops are trying to track down the pot shop bandits before someone ends up dead. And legal weed dealers who pay billions in taxes are asking why the government put them in a bind then turned a blind eye. If we could take credit cards, everything would change overnight. Welcome to the Spotlight. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm David Rose. Ever since Washington voters said yes on recreational marijuana in 2012, pot shops have been popping up all over. And they've always been a target for robberies, but not like they are right now. And that's because dispensaries have the two things criminals want, drugs and cash, and lots of it. And that's making them a target-rich environment. Take a look at this map showing a rash of recent robberies stretching from Vancouver to Bellingham. More than 40 holdups since November, sometimes two or three in the same night. These individuals were armed and incredibly aggressive. Lacey police say the clerks at Forbidden Cannabis were terrorized by three gunmen who took over the store last month and ordered them on their knees, even putting a gun to the back of an employee's head and demanding he empty the till. They feared for their life. The suspects also stole thousands of dollars worth of product and took off in an older model, Red Ford Focus. And we believe that these individuals involved in this specific crime have also uh, targeted other businesses up, uh, up and down the I-5 corridor. And just last Sunday night in Pierce County, a suspect pistol whipped a woman working at the Pot Zone weed shop in Parkland. This kind of behavior is very callous and and uncaring and they're gonna hurt somebody. Businesses are fed up and have banded together. I assume that the police had a list of all the robberies or the liquor board had all, a list of the robberies or somebody did. Then it became apparent that nobody was tracking all of the robberies and we started just to put together a spreadsheet. And every day, we, every morning we update the spreadsheet. We updated it this morning out of another robbery. And once you get it all on paper, it's apparent that it's a real problem. Yeah, last night there was a West Seattle Ian Eisenberg, who owns the Uncle Ike's chain of stores in Seattle, tells us it's so bad, most days start out with him updating the tracker. I have people emailing, texting, direct messaging, calling with um, sometimes uh, news reports or just a lot of anecdotal reports. And then we try to verify the, you know, the date, the time, and what happened, then we add them to the spreadsheet. He started tracking all the cases after a brazen robbery at one of his own stores, where one of his employees talked us through what happened. I was standing outside and I first saw the one gentleman come up and then he pulled out the gun. When I saw him knock down the customer, uh, that I was like, you know, I was actually pleading with the guy, you know, look, he's, he's just a customer. He's had nothing to do with this. Just ease up a little bit because he was standing on him. Please don't hurt him. He's a customer. Please don't hurt him. He's a customer. One guy took our, our shift lead and back to the safe and told him that he had 10 seconds to open the safe or he was gonna kill him. And another guy went in and he was stealing stuff off the shelf and it was all super fast. It was like 40 seconds in and out. It was super, super fast, but it, yeah, it's, it's scary. The one guy was definitely in charge, the guy out, out by the door. He seemed to be like around 30-ish, a little bit older, where the other two were young. I, I mean, the one came in in flip-flops and hopped over, lost his flip, and he just, he seemed not to really know what he was doing. The guy was telling him, just grab that stuff, just grab that stuff, and the other guy, he told him to take, you know, take Zach and back and get the money. For the first few days when people would come up around that corner, I was kind of like, ugh. Um, but, you know, things get normal again and everything goes back, but it's, it's still real eerie there. I, I mean, every time I see somebody come around that corner, I, I, I get a shiver, you know. I actually told my wife and my mom that I didn't have as much to do with it as I, I did, and then it was on the news for three days. Chaos as three men rob a Lake City pot shop with guns drawn. I got outed. My mom was mad at me that I had lied to her and wanted me to quit, and my wife was telling me that I needed to, to go find other work. And, and then they came to me with the driving job. Now I drive the van. I like it here. It's fun. 
people need to be held accountable for what they do. Things have gotten so lax with stuff lately, it, it, it's really scary out there. Are you okay? It's really amazing that nobody got injured in that robbery with all the threats and the firearms being thrown around. But detectives say the suspects in these heists are escalating in violence. It was just before 11 p.m. on January 6th when two armed men walked into Dockside Cannabis and Shoreline for a robbery. One of the suspects will reach into the back pocket of one of the victims there, one of the clerks, while holding that gunpoint and taking his wallet. But their planned holdup quickly went sideways when a store employee fought back and tried to grab onto the second suspect's gun. During the scuffle, the victim falls. He gets kind of thrown to the side and then you can see the other suspect and both suspects start shooting at the victim, hitting him multiple times. As the two shooters leave the store with just a stolen wallet, the victim staggers into the back room while his co-workers dial 911. Our officers quickly were able to provide life-saving measures to that victim by putting on tourniquets on his wounds, uh, ultimately helping save his life in the long run. Major crimes detectives are still working to identify both of these suspects, concerned that the next time they rob a dispensary, they could kill someone. They're businesses of opportunity. They're, they have drugs and they have money, and that's what these suspects are after. Well now, just like in the days of Jesse James, there is a reward being offered for information to catch these wanted criminals. The Cannabis Professionals Network and Crime Stoppers of Puget Sound will pay you $8,000 in cash if you can identify the gunman in the Shoreline case or in other recent armed robberies in Snohomish County and in Renton. So there's an actual task force put together now from the different agencies involved um, uh, to hunt these guys down and take them into custody. Well, hopefully somebody will recognize the suspects. Miraculously, the victim in that shooting in Shoreline survived despite being shot six times. Now, he goes by the name Huckleberry Kid. That's his real name. And I talked with Huck after he came home from his second stay in the ICU. He says being a sitting duck and making $15 an hour with a discount on weed isn't worth losing your life over but he loves helping people. Did you ever worry about your safety working in a marijuana shop? It felt safe. We, we cater to a lot of elderly people for, and um, people who have uh, medical cards. I didn't really think of us as a target as much in that case, uh, in, in that sense, but being cash only, we're an easy target for robberies. Let's talk about the night that you were shot. Take me back there and describe what went down. I see someone walk up to the door, open it up, and I walk away from the counter and ask him for his ID. But instead, it puts a gun on my face. And uh, after that, I'm not really thinking of anything else. I just had to deal with that, you know. And so we, I grabbed the gun and we tussle for a while. And six shots later, him and his buddy had left with a, I think all they got was a customer's wallet. Did they say anything to you? Did he uh, kind of talk me through that a little bit? He put the gun on my face and said, give me the money. And I said, no. Why? <laughs> I'm curious. I don't know. You like, uh, policy is just let them have the money, you know, but mm -hmm. I, I uh, couldn't bring myself really to turn around and walk away from someone who's holding the gun to my head. And then how did it go from that to you getting shot multiple times? Um, well, I'm not Bruce Lee, so my, uh, my handling skills of his gun didn't really keep it away from me. You're gonna be half as badass as you think you are in your mind. And everyone thinks that they can take down a robber, they can, they can you know, manipulate someone's gun out of their hand they can take care of the situation but honestly your adrenaline's going to be pumping you're not going to know exactly what to do you don't know if there's more people coming in i didn't even see the second guy where did he shoot you um i got shot in the leg i got shot through and through in the arm broke one of my bones i got a screw in there i got shot through the abdomen chopped up my liver a little bit um I got another shot in the abdomen and another shot on the top of the leg. After the guy left, I went back into the back room and kind of collapsed on the wall and thought to myself, like, I'm bleeding out. Who do I call? Haley, my girlfriend, the one who's been there by my side for seven years now, I called her. 
He was screaming on the phone. He was screaming out that he loved me a few times. And my gut reaction was like, oh, what did you do? What trouble did you get into? Never that tragedy just happened. He started to tell me that he had been shot, that he was bleeding out. I heard his coworker scream out to call 911. I, I heard all of their panickedness. And I remember just screaming out to him, like put someone on the phone and I could tell he was losing consciousness. It's a miracle you're alive. It really is. It only takes one bullet to get you. And I got six and eight holes. What can you tell us about the suspect that shot you? He was younger than me. Honestly, just like a cute young kid. He had, his voice was high and I don't, I wish that he wasn't living that kind of life because he seemed just, you know, just another kid like me. Would you ever go back to that job? I think so. I, I really do like helping people and I've helped mostly um, medical patients, um, older people who have chronic joint pain and anxiety, people with PTSD. It brings me a lot of joy when people come, come back and say, that worked, that was exactly what I wanted. People working in other dispensaries who see this story, what is your message to them tonight? Be scared. Advocate for your safety. Um, make sure there is security. Stand up for yourself and start, start fighting for yourself because no one's going to protect you unless you start. Well, the safety of employees and customers is a huge concern for everyone in the industry right now, and we'll have much more on that coming up just a little later. It isn't just armed criminals trying to make off with the legal weed money. Our cash-addicted legislators in Olympia have their hands in the till, too. But is their share going up in smoke? Welcome back as we shine a spotlight on these dangerous pot shop robberies. Illegal ganja sales generate massive taxes in our state. But does all that cash go up in smoke? Hannah Kim follows the money. Whether you are a pot smoker or not, all the money it generates, and I mean tons of money, impacts us all. So how much are we talking about? In 2021, Washington State collected nearly $560 million from marijuana sales and license fees. Even more surprising, that is nearly $287 million more than liquor revenue. Do Washingtonians love their pot? I think everybody loves their pot, everywhere in the country, yeah. Since Washington State started collecting taxes in 2014, almost every demographic started using more cannabis. By 2017, nearly 28% of 18 to 24 year olds said they had used marijuana in the last 30 days. But when you change that question to have you ever used marijuana, the highest percentage of users were those 55 to 64 years old, with nearly 68% saying they have tried pot. We're seeing a lot more people my age uh, coming in here than before. And a lot of, you know, I was surprised when we first opened, there were a lot of people that had never tried pot before. So let's follow the money. Where does most of it go? The answer is healthcare. For example, getting low income people access to healthcare through programs like Medicaid. The second largest chunk goes to the state's general fund. For 2021, it was 191 million. And the general fund pays for some of the state's operating costs and things like K through 12 education. Again, a lot of people blame the Liquor and Cannabis Board that somehow they're getting all this money. They have a very small budget. Uncle Ike's owner, Ian Eisenberg, says another misconception is that local pot stores are making bank. The reality is that every time someone checks out at the register, about half of that money goes to taxes right to state and local governments. Most cannabis businesses in the state are barely breaking even or losing money. And outside of those slim margins, Eisenberg says one of the biggest concerns rocking their industry is safety. Too many marijuana store robberies to count, fueled by the fact that pot stores can only accept cash. Because marijuana is a Schedule I drug federally, stores cannot accept credit cards. We can't get Visa MasterCard accounts because credit cards go are interstate. They go across state lines. And therein lies the problem. So Eisenberg says until marijuana becomes a legal nationwide, his number one worry will continue to be when the next robbery will be. 
So Hannah, 32 states now have medical marijuana. If the feds ever actually make it not a schedule one drug. Does that mean people in Washington state can use their debit cards and credit cards to buy it? Yeah, exactly. So that would really be a simple solution right there. For example, up in Canada, right up I five people in Canada, they're able to swipe the visa MasterCard, but we can't do it here yet. So if it's against federal law, aren't the credit unions that get into the weed business and the state violating federal money laundering laws? Well, technically, yes. So this is a complicated situation, right? So back in the Obama administration, you may recall the Justice Department, they sent out a guidance called the Cole Memorandum. And basically what that means is it was telling the state, look, if criminals are not going to profit from legalized marijuana, we'll kind of look the other way. And then also under the Trump administration, they changed that memorandum a bit, but they really didn't do anything about it. But to answer your question, that's why regular banks can't really touch this because on paper it is still illegal. And that is why you have owners like Ian Eisenberg, the person that owns Uncle Ike's. He was saying that at least the credit unions, some of them will touch this because without the credit unions in this situation, we were talking about duffel bags of cash just laying around everywhere. And also too, the credit unions are playing the middleman in this situation because the state wants their taxes. And as you just saw in my piece, we're talking about a billion dollars, David, in a two year cycle. So Hannah, is this ever going to get resolved? Well, I think pot retailers hope that it will sooner than later. But in the meantime, we do have some legislation that was going through the House. It passed, but the Senate, that's where it gets stuck. And I'm talking about the Safe Banking Act. And what that would do is kind of clear up the gray area so that way banks could feel better about doing business with pot retailers. This is big business. and I know you've been looking into the industry. I mean, it's here to stay. People in Washington state have said they love their pot, as you said in your story. How many people does it employ right now here? It is growing, but right now we understand a recent study saying that about 20,000 people are employed in the cannabis industry. And you have to remember that everything is grown and processed here because it is not legal in other states. So all of those smokable flowers and edibles, everything from creams, just, you, you know, it's processed here. So it is big business. And again, it's growing. Yeah, and all highly regulated, but still the safety of these employees and these customers at risk every single day. Hannah Kim, thanks for that great information. Appreciate it. We're coming up next on the spotlight. Until lawmakers do something, stores that can afford it are left to hire armed guards. We shatter a common misconception about guns and drugs next. And we go back to the days when Pioneer Square was full of brothels and card rooms to meet the man who got the better of Wyatt Earp. One legal catch with recreational cannabis laws in our state centers around who can have a firearm inside of a pot shop. Owners can be armed if they're legally licensed to carry, but employees cannot. If stores can afford it, they can hire third party armed guards like the veteran who now protects Uncle Ike's. Out of high school, I went into the military. I was in the United States Navy. I got into NFL security. Being a certified armed security guard, I do have the leverage of being able to be in the pot shops just to make sure that we're secured. I have what you would see on any average police officer that's running around the city of Seattle. Um, I do have mace. I do have a, a, a issued firearm, it's a nine millimeter. I have a pepper ball gun and I have a taser as well. Obviously I have cuffs and a baton. It's more obviously a deterrent too as well. So this is our standard uniform. There's a lot of signs that we look for from vehicles to wearing a complete face mask sometimes refusal to pull your mask down. There's just, there's a lot of factors that are into how we see people that come in here. I mean, in the beginning of the years, we didn't really have that much going on. I mean, if anybody did want to rob the store, it was usually after hours when stores were closed and, and it was more motivated for product, I mean, flour, or edibles, or whatever the case may be. Nowadays, it's more money motivated. We're coming up. Did you know that Wired Earp once opened a gambling hall in Seattle? It didn't go well. The wild story next. Let's take a trip now to Seattle's frontier days when heading to Pioneer Square was a real roll of the dice and Wyatt Earp showed up in town. Alan Stein from History Link shares his story. Well, the story of Wyatt Earp in Seattle does give an, a really interesting illustration of what the city was like at the time. This is 1899. This was when Seattle was still a wild west town. The Great Fire had occurred in 1889, and then 1897, things changed radically because that's when gold was discovered in Alaska. 
and Seattle became the jumping point to get to Alaska. Lots of money had been flowing into the city. People were coming and going, one of which was Wyatt Earp. This is before the Wyatt Earp, the man, the myth, the legend had all built up. That came many years later when he uh, paid to have his biography written in the 20s. And this story was heavily embellished. You know, he was this heroic character, the gunfight at Oak Caker, all this, that's where the legend started to grow. But Earp was actually kind of a, a complex character. He, yes, he was an ex-sheriff, but he worked both sides of the law. He worked as a brothel bouncer at one point. He was a gambler, confidence, trickery, things like that. He had kind of shady elements to him. Obviously, the gold rush interested him. He had opened a saloon up there. And in 1899, on his way back through Seattle, he thought, well, this place is prime for it. There were a lot of people coming back from Alaska with money. Let's set up a gambling house here. This is a prime opportunity. Unfortunately for him at the time, the vice situation in Seattle was heavily controlled, mostly from a man named John Considine. He paid bribes to the Seattle police, to Seattle officials. He also made sure to install a lot of politicians that favored him. He had sort of control over anything vice related. And a lot of these businesses were located in what is now the Pioneer Square area. That was the way of city, the city dealing with it at the time was, well, rather than having gambling houses all over the place, we'll just keep them in this one area where we can keep an eye on them. And at the time when Earp was wanting to set up his gambling house, well, he ran into trouble. Constantine was trying to get warrants against him. A couple months of this, Earp just got up and left. You know, it's just not worth his time. So that was it. He was only here for a couple months, but it is kind of fun to think that Wyatt Earp was running a bar in downtown Seattle. Well, times and technology change, but the Wild West version of Seattle sounds eerily familiar. That's all the time we have on the Spotlight. Until next week, stay safe and be smart.